the Bundeswehr, the army of West Germany, had a difficult birth. Its predecessor, Hitler's much vaunted Wehrmacht, still lay buried beneath the debris of a defeated fatherland. A wartime death toll of 55 million had convinced the victorious allies never again would Prussian militarism be allowed to raise its ugly head in Germany. For 10 years, the new Germany in the West was without its own army, and almost everyone in battered Europe, East and West, were happy it stayed that way. But a distant war in Asia was to change public and military thinking in the West. The Korean War in the early 50s saw the comparative ease with which the communist forces of the North had invaded and almost swamped the South. Could and would the Soviet army do the same in Europe? Contemporary military experts claimed the Red Army could be in Calais only two days after crossing the Iron Curtain. The worried Western allies quickly decided a new German army was desperately needed to bolster the defence against any aggression from the forces of the Warsaw Pact. In 1955, that new German army, the Bundeswehr, was created. Within Germany itself, the new army had a mixed reaction. Well, there was an understanding in Europe, and I think also in Germany, that there should be a German contribution, a military contribution. That was appreciated on the political level. However, on the personal level, people said, well, I had enough. I had served in the army. I had been a prisoner of war. And therefore, we had appropriately a demonstration movement, a, a movement that was critical of what was going on, called the Without Me movement, Ohne Mich Bewegung, which I think so suggests that it was on an individual level that people said, yes, I do understand we need military forces, but I don't think that I will serve. And I think here was the real conflict. The new German army, the Bundeswehr, raised more than a few eyebrows of conventional military men. Its unfamiliar, liberalized lifestyle, its designer-style uniforms, just two factors that generated contemporary claims that the Bundeswehr was a soft army. I'll leave it up to you to suggest that it is a soft army, but it was definitely an attempt to be a different army, not to be in the mold of the Wehrmacht, however successful the Wehrmacht had been militarily. So the idea was to create a completely new army, and the concept was that of a citizen in uniform, who remained a citizen, but only did temporary service in uniform, and therefore it called for a completely different style of officer and conscript relationship, of the question of what is militarily necessary, etc. So it went down to saluting, it went down to the old privileges being abandoned, etc. So it was definitely an attempt of having a new army that has never been uh, the case in German history before. Different or not, the Bundeswehr was to become a vital part of NATO. If ever the Red Armies did move west, it would immediately be in the front line. The great German armament factories had been destroyed. So initially, the Bundeswehr was equipped solely with American-made armor and weapons. Only many years later, would it be equipped with what many military experts claim is the best main battle tank in the world, the Leopard. For almost 35 years, the Bundeswehr remained a vital part of Western defense. But suddenly, in 1990, the unthinkable happened. The collapse of the Warsaw Pact, the breaching of the Berlin Wall, the unification of Germany, Overnight, the Bundeswehr was facing a whole new ball game. The military recognized immediately. Two separate armies in the new Germany was inconceivable. The two armies, the Bundeswehr of the West and the National People's Army of the East, would be merged. But to the bitter disappointment of the soldiers of the East, that merger did not take place. Instead, the Bundeswehr literally marched in and took over what had been the National Army of Erich Honecker's East Germany. Overnight, the Army of the East ceased to exist. Officers above the rank of Colonel were sacked and replaced by officers of the Bundeswehr. Other officers were given only two-year contracts under probation and in almost every case reduced in rank. Typical of the dramatic changes is the home of the 383rd Panzer Battalion at Bad Frankenhausen in the heart of Eastern Germany. 
Since unification, a great deal of cleaning up has taken place, but on the walls still remain the communist-style slogans, urging the soldiers of the NVA to do their best and more. The new commander, the man now living with the enemy, is Lieutenant Colonel Ernst Harder. Taking over the former East German army garrison, he admits, has not been easy. The soldiers uh, used to say uh, in the National People's Army, the equipment was the most important thing. And that, that is not uh, the idea in the Bundeswehr. In the Bundeswehr, our personnel uh, stands in the center of our charity. A vital part of routine to ease the changeover are regular meetings between the former East German officers and their new Bundeswehr commander. Meetings at which, unlike the old days, they can freely express their opinions. It wasn't just a change of uniform. I joined the Socialist Army as a professional, and the change to the Bundeswehr came as a big shock. I was shocked about everything that happened, but I've got over it. Now everything's fine. To be honest, what I'm missing is the old dictatorship. In the positive sense of the word, I miss the social security we used to have. But there are advantages of being in the Bundeswehr. I've got much more authority for making my own decisions, which is something we lacked in the old National People's Army of the East. As far as military craftsmanship, training, etc., there was very little difference between the two armies of East and West. The big difference was in the political system you served. The National People's Army was geared to serve socialism. Most of the officers were members of the Socialist Unity Party, and the party hierarchy was found within the army. There's no doubt the army served the interests of the party. In the Bundeswehr, I'm free to join any party I like. My problem now is that I'm 41, uh, and soldiers of the Bundeswehr uh, appear to be getting younger and younger. Uh, but I've been a professional soldier since I was 18, and so I'll try to stay a professional, only in future in a very different army. All these officers know that in a little over a year's time they could be out of the Bundeswehr, their military careers at a premature end. For them, life is not easy. I think their main problem is that they have to live with the enemy now. In former times they got an enemy picture and um, said that there's an aggressive enemy somewhere at the border and this aggressive enemy is now inside their own territory and they have to live with them. Uh, nearby there are some other problems just as social ones or uh, financial ones. They don't earn so much uh, as, as before. Whatever problems the Bundeswehr takeover has created for the officers and NCOs, for the ordinary soldier of the old National People's Army, the improvements have been dramatic. At Bad Frankenhausen, the entire garrison is being refurbished. Buildings are being gutted of their fixtures and fittings to be replaced with light modern furniture. Sleeping quarters are being modernized as quickly as possible. Once they housed up to eight soldiers in hard, uncomfortable beds, now they accommodate only four men in spacious comfort. For the private soldiers, there's something new, a modern bar and cafeteria for off-duty hours, plus the best-known symbol of the capitalist West, a Coca-Cola machine. One thing that will be got rid of with enthusiasm are the backless stools on which the soldiers of the East were forced to sit upright for all their meals, a strange communist concept that discomfort made better fighting men. 400 kilometers to the south, at Amberg in Bavaria, young soldiers who'd grown up expecting to serve their national service in the Army of the East now find themselves doing the same national service, but in a different army, the Bundeswehr. This is the home of the 124th Panzer Battalion. These soldiers have been in the Bundeswehr just three months. Now they're undergoing a grueling test of what they've learned under the eagle eyes of their Bundeswehr instructors. Under the Bundeswehr options for change, this battalion will soon disappear to be merged with another. But in the battle to keep up morale, information is the name of the game. Of course, it had effect of morale. 
but uh, we have a very high morale in our battalion. Uh, it depends on uh, the information. All the soldiers are informed of the uh, following um, events. At that time, I uh, get to know these events. So the, the moment you learn of things, you pass that on information on to the soldiers? That's correct. In taking over the army of the old enemy, the Bundeswehr undoubtedly hit unexpected problems, not the least of which was the high cost of bringing it up to their standard. One has to appreciate that the decision to absorb the East German armed forces was a political one. The Bundeswehr did not need them. It didn't have any need for these people at all. Therefore, the decision to take on the East German armed forces was a political decision, and it was limited to very few people indeed, if you look at the overall figure for the East German armed forces. I think that the Bundeswehr has done very well. I think, looking back over the last two years, the integration of the East Germans has been a success story. And that's a view shared by both the head of the army and ruling German politicians. In reality, the Bundeswehr was able to do it in a very good time and in a very good way. I think we have a, the best way to do that. And if all institutions and other groups would work so good as the Bundeswehr does it, we had uh, a wonderful re reunification of Germany. Uh, but uh, you must see there are some problems. The biggest problem is change the consciousness, to make people clear what it means to live in a democracy, to be a citizen of a free country, which means you have uh, to develop initiative, you have to develop uh, to take responsibility, and to stay. To, you have the right to make mistakes and to stay for the mistakes. What has been equally successful for the Bundeswehr has been its choice of main battle tank. Long gone are the days they were equipped with the Sherman tanks handed down from the occupying American army. Now they have the homegrown and widely acclaimed Leopard II, a weapon military experts claim is a world beater and, but for political considerations, they say, would have been supplied to the British army. Three short years ago, a Leopard tank of the Bundeswehr would have been seen in East Germany only in combat. Now they're a common sight, taking only their twice weekly exercise. Reaction to the exercises from local people has seen a dramatic change since the Bundeswehr arrived. First, I spoke with the major of the town and with all other leaders in the district. And we said, we are not the same army. We are a different army. We do all things together with our peoples in this district, in this town. We live in this town. We live in this town. We will give them all information about our army. We open our barracks so that they come into the barracks, uh, can see where we uh, live, where we train our soldiers and so on.
almost every army in the world has at some time or other complained about a lack of equipment. Not enough tanks, not enough guns, not enough trucks, not enough ammunition. But the one exception to that rule was the National People's Army here in East Germany. They had the stuff coming out of their ears. On reunification, the West German Army, the Bundeswehr, inherited tens of thousands of Russian-built tanks, trucks and guns, plus 350,000 tonnes of ammunition. They also inherited another major problem. What to do with it all? There are several options, some political, some practical. All of them will be expensive. It's a big problem for us because uh, we got a treaty and Bundeswehr has to um, decrease all the tanks and all that stuff to a certain uh, number. And now the uh, tanks and the uh, war material from the People's Army we got also, and this counts on the number. So this is our biggest problem. All uh, the equipment which comes under the Treaty of uh, uh, Conventional Forces in Europe, CFE, the treaty limited elements will be controlled under the regime of this treaty and they will be destroyed under the regime of this treaty if this treaty is rectified. This is one portion. There we have no flexibility, we are bound to keep the treaty. Destruction of the weapons won't come cheap to Bundeswehr budgets already hard pressed. To destroy a Russian tank or armoured car will cost more than they cost to build in the first place. Billions of Deutschmarks are at stake. Throughout the 45 years of the Cold War, the East German forces never once lowered their guard. An armoured garrison at Grimmer near the Czech border was typical. Troops here were on constant alert, seven days a week. And deep underground, behind thick steel doors and secure from nuclear attack, but now open to our cameras, the nerve center of the entire operation. Thankfully, never put into action. This is the mobilization control center for the 19th Armored Division of what was the People's Army of East Germany. Every piece of equipment here, the armored vehicles, the trucks, the ammunition, it was all kept on constant alert. Once the alarm had been given, the controllers sitting here could have every piece of that equipment on its way into action against the NATO forces in just 41 hours. Just as well, perhaps, that they never came. Now, of course, like so many other relics of the Cold War, it's just a museum piece. The disposal of the Russian-built armour isn't the only problem facing the Bundeswehr. Like every other army in Europe, it's going to be much smaller, down by almost a gigantic 40%. Before unification, the separate armies of East and West total more than 600,000 men. Under the German-Russian treaty, this must be cut to only 225,000 by 1994. Draconian cuts that have sent shockwaves through the Bundeswehr. And there are so many uh, problems. We have to close barracks, we have to give up uh, uh, cities and towns and we have problems uh, for the families and for uh, the civilians working in the Bundeswehr. They have to go from Hamburg to Saxony or to Bavaria and so on. And there are many problems uh, for lodging, for the houses uh, or for the children with the schools and so on. I think there are many, many problems. For me as chief of the army, the most interest is that the soldiers know they can rely on the federal government that they will do their best to help them if they want to leave the forces. And the second point is, at the end of this restructuring, we need a qualified army. And therefore, I always say the German army is now the army of unity, of national unity and of unity as a whole, as army. The Bundeswehr stands alone from all other armies in Europe. It cannot take part in any action outside the boundaries of NATO. The German constitution says so. International criticism during the Gulf War has led to vociferous calls for a change in the constitution. Germany now being united, be living in the center of Europe, and I think Germany, that's my personal uh, feeling and thinking, Germany has to take 
its fair share of responsibility inside the United Nations, which means that uh, in the long run, I think the German government and the, the German parliament, which has to change the constitution, has to come to a result, which means that Germany is taking its fair share. It was always accepted, also by our allies, that Germany was in a difficult position. Imagine a scenario somewhere in the Third World where the Western Allies would have got involved and the Soviets were still the enemy and West German soldiers would have got involved and for argument's sake on the other side there were East Germans. So you could have had a clash of Germans fighting Germans and, and this is a real scenario if you look at the role of East German advisors in countries like Angola, Mozambique and others. So therefore, that was an argument that was taken serious. Now that has all disappeared. And the question is, does the new sovereign United Germany play a role in the concept of allied efforts, yes or no? And I think the Germans have to answer that question. They cannot escape that any longer. The Bundeswehr has come under more international attack over its recent plans to set up a joint military force with the French, the nucleus of a European army outside NATO a move described by the British Foreign Secretary as foolish and dangerous. But the German government concedes the move has a political motive. I think it is very important for us to have a political European Union. This is the most important point for us. And I think that France and Germany, we have tried to start this process. And I would be very glad to see the British way in the same way going Germany and France. We are belonging together. And we would like to have one Europe, the uh, a union of, of uh, Europe. And that means now we try to find the way to go together. And I think uh, the proposal of a call is the beginning for all countries. It's not only uh, for Germany and France, but also for other countries. And uh, I would say, Let's come British soldiers to us and working together in such a call. Why not? Like every other army, the Bundeswehr has its traditions, jealously guarded rituals performed with splendor and passion. On a wet evening, in the castle grounds at Bad Frankenhausen, the officers and men of the 383rd Panzer Battalion mustered for one of their most cherished traditions, the taking of the military oath by the new young soldiers from the east, who were no longer the enemy, but comrades in arms. Yeah, no! 